Behind the Shades. Hello, Laurel. How are you doing today? I'm good, Terrain. Nice to see you. It's nice to see you, and it's going to be even better to speak to you because we have some fantastic topics today, and you are the expert, right? Yeah. I am what? You're the expert, right? I am the expert on <laughs> what I am the expert on perfect, and not perfect. other things. <laughs> <laughs> because this is going to be something that is close to my heart and I'm going to defer to you because I don't have children, but I know the things that we talked about in the green room are very close to my heart because I was an athlete. You sure that you're an athlete? So we're going to basically help those who are... Um, looking to maybe raise athletes that are physically strong, mentally strong, emotionally strong, and everything in between. So why don't you get us started with everything and tell us a little bit about yourself, who you are, and where we can find you all. Yeah, so hi, I'm Dr. Laurel Mines, and I'm a physical therapist. I also have my orthopedic clinical specialty, and I'm a mental performance coach. I work with athletes, mostly young athletes, um, middle school and high school, but I do also sometimes work with collegiate athletes, professional athletes, endurance athletes, and what I call the forever athlete are, you know, older folks that love to play their sports and want to play them forever. And I help, I'm also a mental performance coach. So I help athletes mentally and physically to be able to perform at their peak prevent injuries so they're not sidelined and developed a really unstoppable mindset to help them really succeed both in their sport and in life. And you can find me at my website. I'll give you the short link. It's bit.ly forward slash capital B capital L and then athlete in lowercase letters, A T H L E T E. You can also find me on Instagram at D R L A U R E L P T. You can also find me on YouTube at at D R dot L A U R E L P T. Perfect. I'm going to put all of that in the descriptions because everyone, you need someone like Laurel in your life. Because when I was an athlete growing up, I didn't have anyone besides my parents who were there for me. But one thing that I experienced growing up was. My parents didn't actually come to any of my games except for one. And Laurel, let me tell you something. The one game they came to, guess what happened? We lost. <laughs> we actually got <laughs> blown out. Even though I had a decent game and I was like, I want to be the best that I can be in front of my parents. Maybe if I had someone that was able to keep me motivated along the way, even though I wasn't getting that necessarily from the sources that you always want to, which is your parents, Maybe I could have performed a little bit better. But for you, Laurel, take us from the genesis of this. What made you get involved in young athletes specifically in regards to the areas that you're helping them with? Yeah, so I had this experience when I was younger. I was a student athlete. I played varsity tennis, and um, I also won a national championship in competitive cheerleading in high school. And I had this experience where my parents were divorced and my dad would sometimes pick me up late from practice, like 30 minutes late, 40, like an hour late. I'm standing there. I'm like mortified. I'm like, he doesn't love me. Like everybody else's parents love them, but my dad doesn't love me enough to pick me up and leave me here in the cold in the dark. And this is a little bit before cell phone. So I couldn't just call him up and be like, dude, where are you? Get here now. So what I had this, ex when I had this experience, I thought like, oh, if I was just better then he would prioritize me and he would come pick me up on time. And so I'm like, okay, let me, I went out to be better. So I did more and I did better and I succeeded and I accomplished. And I continue to do that. And I continue to chase what I call the more monster. I kept chasing more and more and more. And I was never satisfied. 
something was always missing. And I lived decades of my life like this until I actually discovered for myself that I was collapsing my sense of self-worth with my dad's, you know, inability to manage his time with his love for me as well. So I collapsed all of these things. And what I did was when I was able to uncollapse it, then I could deal with my self-worth. I could deal with my dad not having, you know, strict time constraints around his time schedule and not managing that well. And then I could also deal with the fact that he really loves me. And when I collapsed all those things, it had me like live this life of chasing this more monster. But when I was able to uncollapse it, I could actually deal with what there was really to deal with in life. And I could deal with it really powerfully. And I know that I can generate my self-worth unrelated to my dad not managing his time well. And now I get to help young athletes to deal powerfully with this stuff without creating these experiences that create their life, you know, without the self-worth or the confidence as they go into adulthood. Was that something you had to learn sooner than later? because you wanted to make sure that you had the value or at least you appreciate the value for yourself that you always should have had. Yeah, I wish I would have learned it sooner than later when I actually did. Um, you know, and through my journey, when I went to a physical therapy school, I really got presence and educated on how about pain and the pain science and how pain is many times more of a, a mental emotional experience than an actual physical experience and in my practice when i actually coach people around their pain while doing the physical therapy there was way more benefits to their actual treatments so when i started to discover some of the stuff for myself and start my own business and start training athletes, I realized how big this mental component was to sports and how they succeed or they not, they don't succeed and how they actually develop into, you know, powerful young adults or they don't. And sports is a really awesome place to learn a lot of life lessons because you know, really sports, whether it's individual or a team sport, it's really about going towards a common goal with a team. And that's what life is really about is accomplishing common goals with other people. And you learn that so much more in sports than in the classroom. So I realized how important this teamwork, the mental performance, and all these things that are there to be developed in in a young athlete and that can really set us up for success sports for me was exactly how you described it it was a sense of place where it was like an extended family for me where when i was home with my mother my father or my brother my sister i was able to go to sports and my coach was like an extension of both of my parents wrapped up in one and i was very close with my coach and i was very close with my team and you have this like unified front, like the locker room becomes like the dinner table, right? Like you can talk about anything in the locker room. And it made me feel like I can do anything. Whereas there was other times in my life where I wasn't as sure, right? So when I was able to get on that playing field, I was 100% confident in myself and 100% confident in everyone around me. Outside of that field, maybe not so much. Did you experience something like that when you were a young girl as an athlete performing well and still trying to figure everything else out in the world? So I coach people, parents and coaches around like as a parent, you're not going to be everything to your child. And as a coach, you can't be everything to the athlete. And it really does take a team to help our kids grow and develop 
into these powerful people that they are. And, you know, you don't have to be everything to this kid, no matter if you're a coach or a parent. And, you know, my experience whenever I was younger was that as an athlete, you know, my mom was super supported, supportive and always there and at the games and pick me up, you know, on time. And then my dad wasn't there, but I was seeking, you know, this relationship with more than one person. And my mom couldn't really be everything for me. And, you know, I did want that team. I did want my dad to be there for me and my coaches. And yeah, so I think it's super important to have a team. And I also want to mention that, you know, it's not just about the parents that aren't present, like my dad or your parents that really weren't showing up. What I've discovered in my practice is, I'll give you an example. I had a 10-year-old gymnast came, referred to me for some negative self-talk around her gymnastics. And she had this experience that my dad calls me a champion. And if I don't win the championship, then I'm not a champion. And then he's not proud. And then I don't know if he loves me. And then she goes out in the world, like there's so much pressure that she has to be a champion or she doesn't live up to this expectation of her dad, but her dad's supportive, loving, like he, you are a champion in my eyes. And in his eyes, like if she doesn't win the championship, he'll probably still think she's a champion. But this experience that she's creating is that there's pressure around this comment. And so you can be a really awesome parent and your kid can still experience these experiences. And we were able to, gen she was able to generate like, hey, if I show up and do my best, then, you know, I'm proud of myself and my dad's proud of me and my coach is proud of me. And we transformed her relationship with failure. So if she does, doesn't win the championship, she has a new relationship to that. And you know, how to take it to the next level the next time and still reap the rewards of being proud of herself and the love from the people around her in that, you know, as a team. What are some of the stumbling blocks maybe that parents and the athletes that you coach are facing in regards to keeping mentally and physically tough? Yeah, so the world that we actually live in today is a really tough world for kids. And it's a tough world for us too, you know? There's things that we have to deal with that we haven't dealt with before. For one thing, like, when do you give a kid a cell phone? Like, we didn't have to deal with that 20 years ago when there was no cell phones to give them, right? And with that said, there is an influx in information going into these young developing brains. And the developing brain looks outward and looks at this comparison to generate themselves and who they are in the world. Um, and that's just how our brain works in, in this comparison. You know, you get some feedback and then you process it and you compare things and judge things. And then, you know, you become this person from this outside feedback. And so people are getting, kids are getting so much feedback. They can't even process it, you know, as quickly as they need to. They're looking outward for their sense of themselves and their self-confidence. And then they're also having to process not reality, but a lot of fantasy out there, you know, on social media, sometimes things look a lot you know, happier and greener on the other side than they really are. So they're comparing themselves to this, like these fantasies that are presented to them, but aren't really the reality. So I help kids to actually turn the focus inward and help them to navigate this whole world and this whole influx of information and be able to powerfully, um, um, dissect and process the information overload that they're actually being um, faced with today in this world of technology. 
So Laurel, as you're as you mentioned in regards to like it's a difficult time for young athletes, and I will 100% agree. I remember, um, and I share this when we were athletes, we didn't have some of the concerns that they do today. But on the flip side is that it seems like there's more distractions. So if I was, if so, take me for example. If I was a young adult and I was a young athlete, and I came to said Laurel. I'm just trying to make it work. I'm trying to stay as balanced as possible. What's some of the coaching tips that you would provide to me in that regard? Yeah, so we look at, you know, a few things to develop in sports. We look at four things from an athlete's perspective. We look at the physical performance. We look at the skill, the strategy, and the mental performance. And I helped develop athletes with their physical performance and their mental performance. And then their skill and strategy, you know, I let the coaches do most of the skill and strategy work. Again, coming back to that team approach. If we break down the physical performance a little bit more, there's six things to look at for their physical performance. We have flexibility, strength, agility, stability, stamina, and power. You know, we also look at rest and recovery, nutrition, hydration, and sleep. So when I look at all of these factors, um, I, I look at, you know, are we developing all of these things in our athletes or is there things that are missing? And when we look at what is missing in developing these athletes, it can play a really pivotal point to identify it and actually address it to help them be very balanced and, you know, perform well, prevent injury and have them be mentally, you know, healthy and well as well. And then I use this team approach. Like I don't develop them in every way. And then I point them in the direction of other team members that can help them. And then I also offer, you know, free injury screening injury prevention screenings at um, some of the high schools around and middle schools around my area. So I also like to tap into some of the resources that are actually available that, you know, to athletes that maybe can't afford some of these services and to offer them to as many athletes as possible, no matter what their economic status is. Would that be more of a self-reflective journey? Whereas they're trying to navigate it and figure out what they need with your assistance, or is that more so you identifying what isn't working and then you helping them, helping them come up with a solution? Yeah, I don't expect them to figure it out all by themselves. And the athletes that I do coach, I, you know, when I do the mental performance coaching, especially they're starting to be able to identify what is missing or what they do need to work on. And I coach them and through it so they can start to identify it themselves. But this process is a lifelong process. And when I'm done with their coaching, my mental performance coaching is six week program. And at the end of the six weeks, they've developed a really strong foundation for their mental performance to show up really powerfully in their sport and in life. But I tell parents, don't expect them to be perfect. Like this is a journey and it takes practice. And these are really awesome skills and it's just going to take time. And, you know, I do coach parents, like, you know, if you do hear some negative self-talk or an opportunity, you could just say, Hey, did you learn anything in this program that you can relate to this problem that you're having? So then they continue to develop the skills that they they are taught so no i don't expect them to do it by themselves and it really becomes a lifelong journey when they develop these skills earlier than later it sets them up for success you mentioned six weeks so at the end of that six weeks journey do you continue to work with them here and there or is it that you're setting up the parents to continue your work with their own child from that point forward? Yeah. So sometimes I only coach the athlete and then they have these 
six principles and framework to, you know, show up with life and life's problems in their sport and in their life. And then I just present the parents to say, Hey, what did you learn from this program that you can apply to this problem that you're having? Sometimes I actually coach the parents in sync with the kids as well. So I'd coach the parents and the kids, and then the parents would actually become the coach. If the parents don't get the coaching, they don't really know the distinctions. Um, they don't really know the language. They, they can't really coach their kid around it. But if they do learn it, then I pass on the coaching to them. And if they don't, for whatever reason, you know, financially or, you know, or they're just not interested or don't have time or whatever it is and the kids still need support, um, we do it on an individual basis. You know, do they want to follow up with me in a few months, once a month, you know, do another round six months or a year from now or whatever it looks like or whatever works for them. I do personalize some of that stuff. That's amazing that you do that because some people, as you mentioned, and as you probably experience, is we all come from different backgrounds financially. Right. Like some people can yeah. afford it from January 1st, 2023 to December 31st, 3023. Right? <laughs> they could just afford mm -hmm. this forever and ever. And there's some other people that are like, hey, Laurel, um, this is a really good program, but they may have to make a decision based on their current situation. And I'm pretty sure you've seen this. You don't want you don't want the child to ever, ever suffer because of those reasons especially when they're that young and they're very impressionable. Um, earlier on, you mentioned some of the distractions maybe that children are going through, especially the, the, the young children, uh, the young athletes. Is there a way that if I was a parent, I can help prepare them better in in regards to them being a young athlete trying to maneuver into the world as I'm coming to maybe get assistance from someone like you? Yeah, so a few things come to my mind. One thing is I tell parents, please let your kids have their dreams. Like, don't step on their dreams. If they say they want to be a professional sports player and they're just really not that good, there's no problem in having that dream. We don't need to be realistic. We don't need to step on their dreams. Like just let them have their dreams. If they have their dreams and then they don't make it, like at least it was fun for them to have their dreams. You know, I, I do have some parents that are like, you're not going to make it. You need to be realistic. But at the same time, like don't be, real don't be realistic. Like shoot for whatever you want. And if you have a higher goal and you don't succeed, you're going to do better and go further than if you have a lower goal and you don't succeed. You see what I'm saying? So shoot big. And then the other thing is, you know, I, I do try to roll out some programs that have varying price ranges to support, you know, communities of all um, economic statuses. I'm working on um, uploading an online program for my mental performance coaching that should definitely be out by the end of the summertime, which I'm excited about. And it'll have a much lower price point than working with me one-to-one. -one. And I also do some group trainings with whole teams. So then that's a lower price point um, than you know, even an online program or the one-to-one -one coaching with me. So I, I try to, you know, set up people so they, there's lots of options, you know, that reaches as many kids as possible. I'm working with some um, school districts right now and some schools um, where they can actually fund some of these projects and make it available to more of their students. Is that a goal of yours to, to work with, let's say, schools and be more involved in the children that are there? Because that would probably expand your network as well, right? Yeah, so I would love to have support in every school, especially for the mental performance coaching. It's life-changing. It's game-changing. Just like I talked about, you know, this 10-year-old gymnast and, like, even my situation. Like, if I had had this 
when I was younger, it would have changed my entire life. And this coaching changed this 10 year old's entire life. Like she doesn't live this life of all this pressure to be this champion. She lives a life of, you know, that it's fun and she has big goals and she has a good relationship with failure and it really changes her trajectory for life. So I would love for this stuff to be possible for and available to every kid in sports. As we close, Laura, what advice would you want to give to the next generation of young athletes who are trying to best prepare themselves to be athletes, but they just need a little bit more guidance than the, than they are currently getting? Yeah, so I think about the participation trophy. So this participation trophy came about that we're going to just give everybody a participation trophy that shows up. And the problem that came about with this is that people are actually collapsing participation trophies with winning trophies as it would as if it were the same. And that's where the problem really came in that they were giving almost like a winning kind of trophy to someone who just participated. And when we actually uncollapse that and we have, we give a participation trophy for participating. And it's known that if you show up and participate, you get this trophy and then you get it, but that doesn't mean you win. And then we give a winning trophy for winning. So that's the problem when you collapse the participation trophy with the winning trophy, when we uncollapse it, it can be super powerful. Some kids need a participation trophy. Some kids need a trophy just for showing up and just for participating. And you just don't know what that kid is going through and what struggles they're going through and what that participation trophy might mean for them. And sometimes we need participation trophies in our own lives. Like as a parent, or whoever you are, sometimes you just need a participation trophy for showing up in life, for waking up, getting out of the bed and like taking care of your family and dealing with whatever life is throwing at you at the time. So give your kids participation trophies, give yourself a participation trophy, but just don't collapse it with a winning trophy. So, you know, when you collapse it with this winning trophy, it's like, well, I just have to show up and then I win. Well, that's not really the reality. Like you have to put in the work and you have to put in the right work and enough work or, or you don't get the winning trophy. And we have to celebrate the winning trophies too. And we got to celebrate them a little bit bigger, right? But don't, don't stop celebrating the participation trophies. And you just never know when celebrating participation trophies for someone just showing up that day at school or at sports or in your life, you just don't know what difference that's going to make. And for some people, it it saves their life, to be honest. That would be something along the lines as you want to acknowledge each and every person that is showing up and giving it their best but you don't want that to be the equivalent of the few people that actually won. Is that my understanding of what you're saying? Yeah, exactly. Like, what does it take to win? Like it it takes certain things to win. And when we, there's this thing called the finish line syndrome that you start to run the race and you think that you won, but you're not, or you think you're at the finish line and you're not. And then that's where athletes aren't even really, mentally or yeah they're not even mentally present in the game they're just in their head and that's kind of like you know get your head in the game right like if you think you're at the finish line and you just started the race like it's not even in reality like you have to keep running until you actually cross the finish line like you don't win until you score more points than the other team and that's just the reality and you can't think that you won when you actually didn't score as many points. And then what is it going to take? Like, does it take you practicing a little more? Does it take you being a leader for your team to show up more powerfully? You know, there's, there's lots of options out there for you, but you can't think that you're winning or at the finish line when you're really not. And the results will really show it. And 
you do have to celebrate the small wins and the big wins. I wonder how much that plays into the fact where you'll have someone that will say that I rather I'm going to use an analogy here, like sports, for example, right? Like basketball. Um, you have a team make it to the finals and lose. Right. But they'll still be celebrated because they came number two. And then you'll have someone else say, well, you lost. I'd rather not make it to the finals and lose than make it to the finals and lose. It's like a different type of mentality, right? Where you have someone who doesn't make it at all, thinking that their victory or their accomplishment is the same as someone who made it all the way to the end and lost. Is that kind of the, the mentality that you're speaking of as well? Okay, would you rather make three million dollars or would you, would you rather make a goal of three million dollars and make two million or would you rather a goal of two million dollars and you make one million you gotta shoot high and then you gotta take what you get but if you don't shoot high enough you really never know what's really possible and what you're really capable of <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.